that in the chat for you to look at. Um, so let's begin our panel discussion. We saw a lot about housing uh, in the film. And so we're gonna start now with Zoe. So Zoe, uh, first I want you to tell us who you are. And then I want you to answer a question about um, some of the practices related to housing. So uh, you've written a lot about the ways the racist practices of redlining have created some of the conditions that we see in the Fifth Ward area, particularly the cancer cluster that we're seeing. Um, as the pandemic has shown, enabling access to safe and affordable housing is really one of the fundamental aspects of public health. So besides redlining, how have other policies failed Houstonians when it comes to housing? Yeah, so first of all, hello, everyone. And thank you, Ronald, for making that beautiful film. I didn't realize that it was you that was making it until the other day. And it was really exciting to learn. And it, it was great to see so many friends featured and, and have their, their stories and histories and family histories honored. Um, so I serve as the Southeast Texas Houston co-director for Texas Housers. We're a housing policy advocacy group and we work closely with, with some of the folks featured in the film. Um, and you asked about besides redlining, how have, have policies failed Houstonians? Because redlining was really early in the, in the short, I just wanna recap for those that, that might've come in a little bit later what the practice was, which was an active policy to restrict the access of especially Black Americans, but all non-white folks in the states to capital and to home ownership and to wealth building, and then forcing them into areas that were under or unregulated for industrial activity or environmental hazards, the kind of which were mapped by Dr. Bullard and his graduate students in the late 70s. Um, so in addition to redlining, there are other current discriminatory policies that hamper um, our ability, especially in Texas and in Houston, to uh, live a life with full dignity in a, in a healthy home. Uh, so I'll start at the state level and kind of work to the local level. Um, first, we have this issue of constant preemption by conservative forces in the state um, against what they call progressive policy. So it's really just good re restorative housing policy that attempts to correct the racist social policy that happened post reconstruction era. Um, so one of one such preemptive, you know, state policy is the the prohibition on inclusionary zoning or inclusionary housing, which would actually set aside affordable housing in all neighborhoods at different price points. Um, and which has been preempted by the state after a municipality attempted it. Uh, then the state also prevents uh, you know, a wide variety of funding sources for local housing trust funds, we can have them, but you can't fund them as robustly as you can in other areas. And what local housing trust funds can do is not only invest in housing, but invest in environmental quality projects and environmental equality projects. So we find that those are really important tools nationwide for people to restore their communities and to preserve their communities and protect them from speculation and from gentrification, and that those are not being, um, you know, as invested in or as robust, uh, robustly protected um, in the state of Texas. And then, you know, the most blatant form of discrimination that's supported by the state of Texas is the source of income discrimination, which essentially says that if you pay your rent with a housing choice voucher, uh, which is a tool that's given to, to people that, you know, some people that need it, uh, that can't afford market rate rent, that uh, landlords are allowed to be in the driver's seat and they're allowed to tell you that you can't rent there simply because of how you earn your money um, or how you earn the income, the source of income that you pay that money with. Um, uh, so, and it's worth noting that black women are, you know, by far the people that use housing choice vouchers the most in the state of Texas. So we have yet another layer of discrimination that they have to move through. Um, and that kind of relegates their housing options to areas of intense pollution or intense violence or intense deprivation and underinvestment. Um, and then finally, there are practices and policies on the local level um, that restrict our imagination about what housing looks like and what health can look like. So we're entering into budget season right now. Um, and we know that budgets are, are really moral documents and that 
we have to invest in the things that matter and that influence very quite clearly the health of our city. But we find ourselves constantly hunting and scrambling appropriations of funds um, simply because we choose to over invest in things like policing um, and under invest in say drainage infrastructure um, or, or funding our housing department with local dollars as well as federal dollars. So we're really seeing these choices and these decisions that Leo said in the documentary mentioned as being central to the health of our community. And they might be really dull and difficult to participate in, uh, but they're absolutely critical to whether or not we can recover from the next storm or recover from the next chemical disaster or hold the next generational polluter accountable. Rant over, Dr. King. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Our next question is for um, Dr. Bakia Nelson. Uh, Bakia, uh, Dolores Magruder, who was one of the residents in the film, talks about the construction of freeways, interrupting a sense of the village of Fifth Ward and degrading air quality. So um, you are the executive director of Air Alliance. Um, can you give us some insight on um, how Air Alliance has been pushing back against TxDOT's freeway project, the I-45 expansion project, and um, how are freeways really sources of some of the environmental injustice and pollution that we see today? Sure. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for having me here tonight, and thank you, Ronald, for, for making that film. So... Um, I'm going to first start by really um, emphasizing the fact that even though we're talking about the, the highway expansion in itself, just to bring home the point of the film about cumulative impacts, that when we're talking about the I-45 expansion, this is not happening in a vacuum, right? Um, we just saw uh, a new news report come out about a cancer cluster in Fifth Ward, right? So, a highway expansion and the health impacts um, that that would bring with it is on top of all of the other environmental injustices that the communities are facing already, right? So you have layer upon layer upon layer of um, exposures to environmental toxins that are compromising the life expectancy of people um, living in these communities. So I just wanna start with that, that the highway expansion is an, an added layer of um, environmental injustice onto communities that are already experiencing this. Um, from an air quality perspective, and particularly as it pertains to I-45, we know from TxDOT's own analysis that the freeway is going to put um, schools and daycare centers and other um, groups who are more vulnerable to the health impacts of, of uh, air pollution closer to the freeway. And research has shown that within 500 feet of a freeway, that air pollution exposure is the highest and also the most toxic and most harmful to health. And so when you're talking about school children um, who are particularly vulnerable to that, what we also know um, for example, with Bruce Elementary School um, that's in Fifth Ward, this, this school is already within that zone near the freeway and this expansion would bring it closer. What we also know about Bruce Elementary School already is that children who attend Bruce Elementary School already have a higher than average um, rate of use of emergency services um, for, the, uh, uh, for asthma attacks. And so we're talking about um, school children who are already um, experiencing higher than average um, uncontrolled asthma and now bringing the freeway with more air pollution uh, closer to the schools. Uh, some people say, well, the answer to that is to keep the kids inside. Well, um, I don't know if you remember being a child, but you should be able to go outside and play. <laughs> um, and particularly <laughs> while you're at school. So um, those are some of the ways in which um, 
particularly as it pertains to air quality. But in addition to that, I want everyone to really imagine what it would be like to receive a notice um, from a governmental agency telling you that you have to remove yourself from your home, right? And the letter isn't just, you know, to Dolores's point, the letter is not just telling you that you have to move, right? This letter is disrupting your life as you know it. It is severing um, all of those relationships. It is severing your community, um, your connection to your community, to your neighbors, um, your children's connections to their friends, um, right? That's, that's what that means. And so that, uh, you know, at the heart of it is really displacing people from their everyday life as they know it. And that has disproportionately happened to black people in this country from the founding of this country. And that is something that's being perpetuated by this um, expansion. So I'm gonna stop there, but those are just a couple of examples. Thank you, Bakia. Um, so uh, our next question will go to Mr. Keith Downey. Um, Mr. Downey, as Super Neighborhood President of Cashmere Gardens, um, you're listening to residents every day. Yes. Um, so they're talking to you about um, many of the cumulative effects that um, Bakia just talked about. Um, they sh I'm sure they share with you their aspirations, their visions for the community, and those can be different from what City Hall or the State Capitol might be thinking. So what do they tell you they want? Um, what do they tell you that they love? And, and share with us, what do they tell you they love and value about Cashmere Gardens? They love the fact, my name is Keith Downey, first of all, uh, Super Neighborhood President for Cashmere, as you mentioned, and also Director, Founding Director of Northeast Houston Redevelopment Council. Uh, when we have our meetings in the community, uh, people are expressing how they feel, what they are looking for, their aspirations for our children as well as our residents. Um, you know, they express the fact that they want a healthy community. When they are hearing from, for example, the new cancer cluster they, uh, report that came out yesterday, when they're hearing plausible deniability, uh, this, this is not, of course, is not fair to the residents, but the fact of the matter is those who are making these statements and putting the statements out for plausible deniability do not know our community. We're never around with the company uh, when as these things were taking place and are taking place right now. Uh, our community is, is uh, a family community. Uh, it's where our children play. It's where our, our, we have our institutions of learning with our schools. We just got our library back in the community. And it's very important that we all understand that we have to work together. No matter the generation, we must work together to have a stronger community. And we, it's gonna take not only with the seniors, not only with our young people, but it's gonna take us all. It's gonna take business owners as well to do that. And what I would say to our youth, we must get involved in the things that matter in this in our lives. There are advocacy groups uh, like SEER, uh, Air Alliance, and others out there that are fighting uh, for these fighting against these injustices that are happening to us. And it's very important that we come aboard, write those elected officials reach out to them, research, understand that State Senator Boris Miles has a proposed bill out there, uh, Senate Bill 87, that's addressing permitting of concrete batch plants. Because in Northeast Houston, we have six concrete batch plants. And it's very important that we understand that we want a healthy community. We want a community that thrives I don't know if everybody realizes it, but with the highway expansion, it's killed an economic corridor in each one of our black communities just about. 
Emancipation with 288, Kelly Street with 610 Loop coming through Kashmir, and Jensen Drive when they built 59. So we have many um, environmental injustices that have occurred to us. Progress is not always progress for us. And we, as is said by uh, Dr. Allen, we're not a checkbox. Many times these entities come out to our communities and they, they have, they'll say, well, I've been out to Sunnyside. So uh, our organization, our department did that. Uh, we came out to Cashmere Garden. We're not a checkbox. We are living, breathing human beings. And we want exactly a quality of life that is on the other side of town as well. You know, the affluent wouldn't be affluent without those of us in the black and brown community that helped them to be wealthy. So what we're asking for is, is e equality. We're asking for you to address the things that we have residents that are dying, dying because you became wealthy. And you have to understand, do your research, understand how this came about. They're dealing with things like railroads going through their, their property, uh, through their uh, communities. They're dealing with the fact that you have uh, pack batch plants. You have emissions from the highways that are cutting through their community. They don't have enough of a lot of things and resources such as trees. You have a lot of affluent, a, a lot of trees in your community that act as canopy to provide oxygen. You have parks, you have many things, many amenities that we do not have. So what I would say to the community and in our young people, get involved in the things that matter, get involved in the things around you that will affect generations to come. We don't want you to be the last generation to come along, always aspire to bring along another generation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Downey. Okay, this question is for Ms. Lydia Azuna. Uh, in follow-up to the great pep talk Mr. Downey just gave our young people, um, if we want to talk about gerrymandering and really how it prevents uh, representation of communities at the local, state, and federal level, what would you tell young people to inspire them to run for office um, and uh, come back and represent their communities? Uh, thank you for having me on the panel tonight. Um, my name is Lydia Ozuna, and I am the lucky person right now to be president of our, an organization called Texans Against Gerrymandering. And what we focus on is on helping people to understand that undergirding all of these issues is one big democratic problem that we have, and that is in how we draw the maps for representation. If we can fix that one issue, then it'll be easier for, our, for anyone to run for office and to get elected and truly represent the community that they aspire to represent. And so not just to young people, Dr. King, but to, I happen to be 72 years old, right? So to uh, older generation too, uh, the one thing that we can do right now in this redistricting cycle is to bring our stories forward to the committees that are making the decision on how to draw the maps. That's number one. You know your community better than anybody else. You can talk about the impact that the way the lines are drawn have on you. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing that can be done is with the Voting Rights Act, we saw an increase in the number of, finally, of people of color being elected to positions. And we saw the implementation of single member districts. However, partisan gerrymandering has taken over, like my father used to say, like nobody's business, right? And 
that is at the core of what we are struggling with. And the only way to overcome that is for all of our communities, uh, the Fifth Ward, all of the environmental communities, all of the different types of interests that are working to make our communities better need to come together and collaborate on these issues. So if you're a young person, talk to other people from other groups about what you want done uh, and contact your elected officials and let them know what you are thinking and what it is that you require from them. As the lady in the uh, film said, hold them accountable. Tell them you voted for them and that you need them to do X, Y, and Z for you. And then follow up. Don't let it be just one phone call. Keep calling, keep calling, keep calling until hopefully they get tired of hearing you and maybe they can do something, right? Um, the, um, Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't have a chair for you, bring a folding chair. And the folding chair that we have right now is the ability to talk to these people and to tell them what it is that we want. Not just for air quality and all these other things, that is very important. But until we change the system that determines who gets to run for office, we're really fighting an uphill battle. So I, once again, I wanna thank you for allowing me to speak. I hope I have addressed the question adequately and I'll be happy to answer any questions um, at the end. Thank you, Ms. Lydia. Ms. Doris, um, it was such a memorable line in the film uh, when you said, when you look in that mirror and you ask yourself, have I done enough? The answer is always no, because there's always something else to be done. Um, that's probably a shared feeling amongst uh, many of the residents of the Fifth Ward community and those of us who've joined today. Tell us what inspires you to keep, first tell us who you are and tell us what inspires you to keep fighting. My name is Doris Brown. I work for the nonprofit West Street Recovery. I'm the co-founder of Northeast Action Collective and the, and the Harvey Forgotten Survivor Caucus. And what keeps me going is my love of people. You know, I started raising cane when I was about 14 years old <laughs> during the civil rights movement. I, uh, I used to shoot hooker from school and go to TSU to be with the seniors and the students over there. And we would go downtown and sit at the counter at F.W. Woolworth all day long, hungry. They wouldn't even give us water because I felt that that was the right thing to do. And my love for people has always, it's never wavered because I always ask myself, what can I do? And it's just been um, like, like Lewis said, it's the fight of a lifetime. You can't give up, you gotta keep going. And see now, <clears throat> I'm 71 years old. I have great grandchildren. And I want them to see their Gigi out here not giving up. They Gigi study going forward. They Gigi doing something for the health and safety of the community. And that's what I, that's what I try to inspire because I want everyone to step up, step out and get involved because this is the fight of a lifetime. And there's always something that needs to be done. They look at us as sacrifice zones. That's what our neighborhoods have become. You can't breathe. Our children having the respiratory and asthma. I suffer with asthma and COPD. I grew up in Fifth Ward. You can't go outside at night and see a star or a constellation. I want my babies to be able and everyone to be able to see this. I love seeing the constellation and I got to drive way out of the city limits in order to see this. I want them to be able to walk out their front door and look up and see it. This is what, why I keep fighting because I just cannot give up. 
And I want to inspire everyone, especially the young ones. See, we have to start this now in order to be show them how it's done. We have a um, thing at our at our at our at West Street where we each one teach one. That means the the residents and the people of the neighborhood. We want to empower them to go out and keep this fight going. And then they will empower someone else, generation after generation. It's all about the empowerment of the neighborhood and the, uh, the communities that we surround us. We cannot give up. This is the fight. And this is what I like doing. So, yeah. Well, we thank you, um, Ms. Doris, for fighting um, and for representing the communities that need their voice heard. Um, our last question is for Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, we want you to share with us um, more insight on a pathway for creative people like yourself to be more active and active with communities such as the Fifth Ward community and telling these kinds of stories and illustrating, you know, true environmental justice. Uh, so I guess that's a really it's a tough question uh, because I've done so much uh, uh, in the way of trying to connect my artwork with activism uh, and community building and outreach. Um, when I think about um, activism and how to get involved, I always think of like, you know, like most people think of like the 100%, what is the most I can do? And it's like, you know, essentially like dedicating your whole life to it, uh, which so many folks have had no other choice but to uh, to do uh, no other route. But what I've learned through all the things that I've uh, partnered with and taken up uh, is that you don't have to do 100% all the time. Uh, you can do 10%, you know, 10% is just, you know, picking up trash as you're walking, you know, don't let trash stand where it is uh, as you're walking or, um, you know, the last summer I organized, or I say I, but it was a group of individuals, creatives organized to raise uh, funds for a legal defense for the uh, Houston uh, Immigration Legal Services. Uh, and that was a really hard thing, but it was, that was a 100% thing uh, where it took all the resources that I had, all the resources that I could uh, get the community to uh, provide uh, whether it be art, uh, money, time, uh, whatever, but um, I don't know. I, I think it, it's really based on what your level of comfortability is and also knowing what your limits are. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is burn yourself out because the second you do, uh, that means that someone else has to pick up that slack uh, and not so much that it's slack that, uh, you know, unwanted, but uh, you put a person in a position that they now have to carry your weight instead of having voice that opinion or voice, voice to concern about how much commitment, how much commit, how much you're willing to commit to that opportunity for their uh, initiative. Um, uh, for me personally, uh, I've just kind of taken, I, I think the Nina, Nina Simone like route where uh, I can't divorce, I, I can't divorce myself from the community that has sustained me. So uh, in everything that I do, I have to represent them uh, and always making sure that if I'm walking into a door that I am uh, at all times representing the community that has sustained me and put me in that position. Uh, so walking away from this, you know, I'm also like uh, carrying the stories of all these individuals and not just the ones that were featured, but the ones that they, uh, that they carry with them uh, because it's all our job and all our responsibility to look after each other. Uh, you know, art and community are the same thing. Uh, uh, for me, there's, there's no separation from any of them. So. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, so we are coming to a close and I just kind of wanted to share with you some of the uh, kind of call to action types of 
quotes or uh, top, I guess, themes that I kind of gleaned from our conversations from the panelists, from the film, the wonderful film. Thank you so much, Mr. Jones. Um, so our, I think our call to action today is really kind of be a change agent. Um, if, if you want change, get involved, make the change, be the change. Another one was vote, put people in office who represent your views, um, who are going to look after your communities like Representative Alma Allen. Um, Mr. Downey talked about um, Commissioner um, Ellis and also uh, Senator Miles. Um, hold people accountable. So when we put people in office, we should hold them accountable if they have told us that they are going to um, have our best interests in terms of our communities and making sure that um, we're safe, our communities are healthy, we have good air quality, water quality, we have access to care, fresh fruit and vegetables, all the things that make you have great um, health and well being. We should attend meetings. I, I can't remember who said that, but someone, I think it was actually Representative Alma Allen who said, go to the meetings, voice your opinions, let your, your um, voice be heard. And then, Mr. Jones, you said, find, you didn't really say this, but I paraphrased you. You said, find um, what you're comfortable and willing to commit to. And so I think that that is um, our take home for today. We all need to figure out how, you know, what we can do in the community to, to help others, figure out what's comfortable for us and what we can commit to doing. And so I thank you all for joining, joining us this evening. Um, I think there's going to be one more slide. There it goes. And so if you are um, interested in connecting with any of our panelists, you'll see their names and um, organizations here on the slide. And there will also be more information sent to you um, very soon, maybe in the next couple of days. Um, and follow up to this um, to this evening's workshop. So thank you so much for joining us and have a great evening.